This episode is being brought to you by Mount St. Joseph University. Mount St. Joseph University offers a number of programs for educators interested in graduate or doctoral work focused on the science of reading. We are accredited by the International Dyslexia Association and offer a fully online reading science certificate, dyslexia certificate, and master's degree. The doctoral program is fully online during the school year with an annual on-campus summer institute. To learn more, visit our website msj.edu backslash reading dash science. Hi, and welcome to Teaching, Reading, and Learning, the TRL podcast. The focus of this podcast is to elevate important conversations in the educational community in order to inspire, inform, and celebrate contributions to teaching and learning. Our guest today is Dr. Anita Archer. I am delighted to be with her today. She has been an influence on so many of us with her tremendous contributions to the field, Uh, enriching our understanding of explicit instruction. And I know Anita is very well known to most of us in the educational community, but if you aren't familiar uh, with her, let me share a little bit more about her. So Anita Archer, PhD, is an educational consultant to school districts on explicit instruction, the design and delivery of instruction, behavior management, and literacy instruction. She has taught elementary and middle school students and is a recipient of 10 awards honoring her excellence in teaching and contributions to the field of education. Dr. Archer has served on the faculties of San Diego, San Diego State University, the University of Washington in Seattle, and the University of Oregon in Eugene. She is nationally known for her professional development activities, having presented in every state over the course of her 50-year career. Dr. Archer is co-author with Dr. Mary Gleason of numerous curriculum materials addressing reading, writing, and study skills. Raised in the Pacific Northwest, Anita's primary home is in Portland, Oregon, where she enjoys entertaining friends, attending symphony and opera performances, and practicing her cello. Which, by the way, she notes in her biography that she's a beginner, but more on that later. So this conversation is really going to to bring to light Anita's beautiful vision for our students and teachers and her relentless commitment to teaching. And we'll also learn how it all began with a fourth grade teacher who wore holiday hairnets and practiced kindness. You don't want to miss this one. Welcome, Anita Archer, to our podcast today. I'm just so delighted that uh, I have the opportunity to talk with you. Um, I know that um, I know that you're a big traveler, and now you're 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 tuning in from your home in Portland. Am I right about that? Life has changed. Yes, life has changed. Well, it's lovely to see you today. Um, so I'd like to just jump right in because I know our listeners just are so curious and interested uh, to to hear more from you. I, I know you've been in education now for 40 years and you started out, you started out as, it, oh, how many? 54. 54? Did you say 54? Yeah. Wow. Bravo. You, isn't it? Bravo. <laughs> Bravo you. <laughs> yeah, and did you, was teaching your first career? Teaching was my only career. Um, yeah. For the- years, all I've done is education. Yeah, yeah. Is te- did you were you a classroom teacher first? I was a classroom teacher first, mm-hmm. uh, and um, I was a special ed teacher at mm-hmm. Issaquah Valley Elementary School. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yes, that was definitely the beginning of my career. Yeah. And yeah. Well, do you want to hear more about? It? Yeah. What? Ma- yeah. What? What made you go into teaching? What, you know, it's hard to pinpoint the moment when you decide to do something. Uh, but there was all kinds of things leading up to it. My family, I grew up in the state of Washington mm-hmm. uh, on the uh, eastern side, which is mostly farming and rural. Mm-hmm. And we mm-hmm. live in seven different communities and 14 houses before I was 18. Wow. 
an experience most people don't have. Yeah. I'm going to be a nomad consultant later on. <laughs> good training ground. Very good training ground. <laughs> uh, and so many years, uh, I would be coming in mid-year to a school. Mm-hmm. And so it was sort of my sacred place to be. And it was uh, these gracious teachers who uh, invited me into their classrooms and supported me. Uh, And so I began there. But then uh, I think the seed was planted in fourth grade, very intentionally by Mrs. Finkel. Mrs. Finkel, my favorite teacher, uh, was in her last year of teaching. Uh, And she was a, a, a miraculous woman, but she wore... Uh, hair nets uh, over her gray hair, uh, which I've not gone to, but uh, <laughs> yeah. and you could tell when it was a holiday because then she would put on her Christmas net, uh, her Easter net, uh, or, or just it's somebody's birthday net. Uh, and so <laughs> we were very well. When I first came to her, uh, it was the uh, third school that I had had that year. Uh, in fourth grade. Uh, And so uh, I was uh, really reluctant to be in a new school again, a new class again. And I had just read a book about a selective mute. So I took a little piece of paper after my parents had left and I had talked to her and I wrote down, I am a selective mute. And I wrapped it up and handed it to her. (laughs) Can you imagine what happened in the a coffee room over that note, Mm -hmm. but she honored it. She didn't force me to talk for, I, you know, a few weeks. Uh, And uh, then, uh, you know, I couldn't hold back. Finally, it was too much trouble (laughs) to be a selective mute. And so she just, she never forced it though. That was very interesting. Mm -hmm. So one day uh, in the winter, it was in the winter and it was snowing, 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 and we were putting Uh, on uh, our garb to go outside, as did Mrs. Finkel. And she caught her net in this pin. That's a heart. And she said across the room, Anita, come help me. And so I came over and she said, help me get this net out. And then she put it on my coat. And she said, someday you'll be a teacher and give children your heart. Now, don't you think that that (gasps) is destiny? I don't think I had an option. What a beautiful story. And you. And she retired (sighs) that year. uh, And, uh, but it was, you know, just the care she gave me, the fact that she believed that if you were going to be a teacher, you should teach well, but you should also be kind. Uh, and so it was like the perfect seed planted. Yeah. That is a beautiful story. And the fact that you still have that heart. I have that heart. Absolutely. Oh, I can see why that inspired you to go into teaching. What a great story. I, you know, I don't think I thought about it later, like you've got to be a teacher, you have to be a teacher. I think there were, my life has been filled with Uh, total goodness of people and total opportunities. And uh, I've learned over time that you also have to be very present and work hard wherever you are, do your best wherever you are. And so then I went to college uh, after I graduated from high school. Uh, And in my family, everyone went to the University of Washington. So I mean, it wasn't even like a decision. Well, you're just going there. Okay, so I went there. And, um, but I got early on as a sophomore, uh, I got a research assistant as an undergraduate uh, for one of the best researchers and writers uh, in special ed, uh, Tom Lovett. And so I hadn't really considered it as a career at that time. I was in sociology and psychology, and, but that planted the seed again, um, because I took all the data as he was uh, doing research studies. So, and yes, uh, so those, you know, you sort of sometimes you have opportunities that are given to you. Mm-hmm. So I finished, I went right uh, from undergraduate to a graduate uh, degree in special ed. 
And uh, there, Joe Jenkins, who was another, as well as Tom Levitt, continued to be mentors, and they were brilliant managers uh, in terms of education. And then I got a job uh, teaching in Issaquah, which is a school district right outside of um, Seattle. And um, it was a wonderful school and a wonderful job. I got teacher of the year and uh, three years into it uh, from the, um, a, a state grant or state uh, group. But it was so interesting. My sister just recently sent me the picture. She found the newspaper picture of me getting this. And they said that it was supposed to be a man. But we had to make a, from our national we had to ask could it be a woman <laughs> okay so things have changed uh yeah. and so there it was uh so it was they had to say we had to get special permission to oh give the young yeah. teaching award to a woman okay you know isn't that interesting so i mean to think that that was so unusual right that you had to get you know dispensation to be able to give it to a woman um right because it was <laughs> It was just expected. Yes, it was mm -hmm. young man in education, the young man in, in many different fields. So anyway, it was quite a delight. So oh. I just had this abundant opportunity. So yeah. I taught, uh, and then um, I, you know, I've just been blessed. I had um, an early opportunity to be an acting assistant um, professor at University of Washington. Uh, only I was twenty six, uh, and uh, a faculty person died. And so they asked if I would come teach classes. Well, not too many people get that kind of opportunity. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you know, opportunity is born of, you did a really, really good job at what you're currently doing, opens up the doors to opportunity. Yes, yeah, you know, I, sorry, go ahead, sorry. But, but I have to tell you, uh, you told me you were gonna ask that question and I had to get out like a little history, my uh, Vita, because 54 years later, some of these things in terms of the sequence and so forth are less visible. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you yeah. for making me do that. Oh, my gosh. Well, it's such a what a great story. And I think people, especially teachers, always want to hear, you know, from people that they really admire. How did you know what were your humble beginnings in education and what are some lessons you've learned? And it sounds like, you know, one of the big one of the big lessons that you're bringing forward here for us is this idea of mentorship and how you know you were nurtured by mentors and i was having a wonderful conversation with parker palmer and he was talking about the power of mentorship and how you know he felt uh, the blessings of being you know of the gifts of mentors through most of his adult life and then all of a sudden he mentioned how the mentors just kind of disappeared and he thought you know where are my mentors then he realized it was that that arc of life when now he is designed to be the mentor. And I wonder if you had an experience like that. Well, most of my career or much of my career was spent at three universities. And so I had students uh, and you're an automatic mentor if you connect with them. And I did um, probably my, uh, after University of Washington, University of Oregon, the Ducks, uh, I had remarkable years at that beautiful university mm -hmm. uh, and many of the people that I still work with, uh, my co-author, Dr. Mary Gleason, was my student, mm -hmm. the most brilliant person I've ever known in education mm -hmm. uh, and treat to work with. Um, people like Ann Watanabe, who's now a leader in Hawaiian education as a consultant. And so uh, mentoring going on. And then other mentors today, mentees. Yes. So, uh, but you know, it, there is not a body of knowledge that doesn't have a history. And sometimes we forget that uh, people present knowledge if it, as if it was their new uh, vision. And that's never true. I have had the gift of you know, learning from Tom Lovett and from Joe Jenkins, going to University of Oregon. At that time, Siegfried Engelman was there, my really good friend and collaborator, Doug Carnine, uh, learning from them. And so it's, it is accumulation. 
all of us have that. Uh, all knowledge has deep roots. Mm -hmm. And so we have to honor those deep roots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate that. And I, I, the people that you're naming are people that I think, like you, I consider them groundbreaking, you know, groundbreakers in our profession. Um, and there's a fertile field, mm -hmm. See that? Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, the field was already set and they were groundbreakers, but on a very fertile field. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, you know, one of your mottos that I've heard you use over and over again is um, how well you teach is how well they learn. And I love that motto because there's so much, there's simplicity and truth in that. Um, and I wonder if that simplicity in truth is one reason why so many educators, you resonate with so many educators. Um, why do you think your work has such has struck such a deep chord with all of us. Well, I think that you hit a, hit a big point. So my work, which at least in the books I've written and in what I've incorporated in curriculum materials that I've written and I train across the country is under the umbrella of explicit instruction. Uh, and an explicit instruction basically is looking at what does our research tell us about what we can do in the classroom that will lead to learning. Uh, and uh, so it looks at what do we know about content that is critical and broken down? What do we know about design? Uh, do we tell the objective? Do we do a uh, consistent review? Do we do demonstration guided practice checking for understanding? Mm -hmm. uh, do we deliver it with high active participation, frequent responses? Uh, do we deliver it uh, where we are monitoring and giving feedback. I mean, these are just very basic things that have huge amount of research and excellent uh, effect sizes, no matter what research you look at. Uh, and so, and one of the things that I've done is over time, I've often utilized uh, adages or mottos to summarize. And I think that one is one that I learned as a teacher. Uh, how well you teach equals how well they learn. My lack of clarity leads to their lack of clarity. My, my not breaking it down to obtainable yeah. pieces reduces their ability to process it cognitively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But so uh, one, one of the highlights of my career was getting a award from the state that I'm in, Oregon, uh, as an educator. Uh, and um, my students, my former students, uh, from three different universities sent in adages that they remembered. Uh, adages for content, like teach the stuff and cut the fluff. Okay, so that anything that wasn't particularly for students that are struggling. Uh, ones for the design of a lesson, which would be things such as, uh, I do it, we do it, you do it. Demonstration, guided practice, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. checking for understanding. Mm -hmm. Ones for uh, the delivery, such as learning is not a spectator sport. Okay, to remember that big idea yeah. of guest responses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And management, my favorite management is avoid the void for they will fill it. I love that. I love that. And and, and I, I think those are, and the, what's interesting is that you went back to your students and asked them what they remembered. And these just came up for them because these are these 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 truths right. that are that are presented in a in a very memorable way. You know, one of my other favorites uh, from you is "Teach with passion, manage with compassion." Now that's the only one that was given to me by a child. I love that. Tell 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 us that story. Tell us that story about the child. I was in Salinas, um, California, doing demonstrations quite a long time ago. Uh, one of the ways that I've maintained my teaching skills is I often, when I work with districts, I will do demonstration lessons. Okay, so and I taught a demonstration lesson. And then, you know, the beauty of California is uh, when kids go out to recess, it's beautiful. Uh, and so I went out with them. I wanted to check and see if they uh, played the same games that other schools played. And so I'm standing there and there's this boy running across uh, the field. And he came to me and I said, hi. And he said, I was in the class. I said, yes, you were. 
He said, if there was a teaching contest, you'd win. <laughs> now that could make your whole career. I mean, that, that, that is a victory right there. Right. But he yeah. went on. I said, why did you say that? And he said, with this intelligence of a fourth grader, you teach with passion and you manage with compassion. Now, given that gift, how could you not follow that for the rest of your career? You, you just, yeah, it's just, yes, you can. And you know, what's interesting, he was a fourth grader. And I, I think back to the story you told about uh, Mrs. Finkel in fourth grade and how she, she brought kindness, you know, to, to the classroom. So interesting intersection of fourth grade right there. Lessons, lessons from fourth grade. Or lessons from fourth grade. <laughs> but, you know, that really does summarize. Uh, you know, I watch teachers all the time now because one of the things I've been doing virtually is training um, principals, administrators, literacy teams uh, on observations and feedback to teachers. And it is so clear to me that a teacher who's totally present, a teacher who is passionate about teaching, a teacher who's passionate about the content, and then follows uh, the, pa the pathway of explicit instruction, you know, that they have an objective, that they review, that they do demonstration, guided practice, and active participation, that it uh, is so critical that those things be in place for learning to occur. And I think sometimes we forget our outcome. Our outcome is learning. You know, I always say this, you know, if you were a corporate president uh, and you were in charge of that company, your outcome is profit. Our outcome is learning. Yeah. And sometimes we have our attention taken away uh, with an activity forgetting the importance of learning. And so just, I watch this and I can see how critical, again, how well you teach equals how well you learn, how well they learn. You know, I think about my own uh, coming up as a teacher and, you know, there was a lot of, I always say this, there was a lot of teaching around reading, you know, and, and I own that. I mean, I, I taught around reading, but I don't think I really taught them to read, right? It was more just like activities surrounding reading and from that reading would come. Uh, you know, so I, so I, so I, I, what you, what you talk about is so um, resonant for me. I love what you just said. Maybe you've got another little um, adage here, the three P's, presence, passion, and pathway um, for learning to occur. To add those. <laughs> Yeah, from Laura. <laughs> because uh, you had passion and... Yeah, you, you just said teachers need presence, they need passion, and they need to understand the pathway to for effective instruction. Good job. Yeah. For learning to occur. If you've looked at um, uh, Hattie, John Hattie looked at uh, credibility of teachers as viewed from their students. And one was that they had a uh, passion for the content and passion for teaching. That's how they believed they, they were credible as teachers. Uh, and that they knew the content, but also how to, to teach the content. You know, you had an eighth grader there or a 12th grader, they're pretty astute about what makes a difference. Uh, and so passion does make a difference. Being present, you know, uh, it's sort of a Zen quality, but always being present wherever you are, not letting your attention waver, not let your thoughts waver. And you can feel someone's energy when they're present. And so I think presence makes a difference in everything that yeah. I do. I, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that so much, Anita, because... Um, it's hard to do um, because people, I think teachers are so distracted by so many demands on their, on their work and on their lives and maintaining, you know, that, that stance, it really is a, it really is a stance that you go into that stance of presence is, is one of the greatest gifts I think we give to the other 
whether that other is our spouse or a friend or our students. It's just a tremendous gift. And I believe you're right. I believe people can feel that presence as a gift. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, so when I think about your work in professional development, and like I said, you know, I think your work just resonates with so many people because of the, the truth um, of, of what you share just in, in, in very simple, simple ways, but yet the concepts are not that simple. Um, so when you are always simple. Yeah. I think that, um, it works. Uh, and so when I follow the pathway that you just utilized that term, when I follow that pathway and I couple it with the appropriate amount of practice and the appropriate amount of cumulative review and the students learn. Now that is the gift that we give to children is that they would learn and that they would feel competent. Uh, and it's sort of like the research on motivation of children that we used to think we had to have a hook, something to capture their attention. What we now know is that success is what breeds motivation. Uh, and I mean, I'm taking cello lessons. And uh, when the pandemic came, I said, I should go back to cello and take more lessons because uh, I am definitely a beginner. But I could see that at the point where I could play something that someone might recognize that seemed melodic, that felt the vibration felt good against my body. Wow. Now I want to give it energy. Now I want to get up morning and practice. And so that just reminded me of how we must give children success so that they will be motivated to give it energy. But the same thing is true with teachers is that when teachers are successful and their kids learn, yeah. they're significantly more motivated to do what's necessary to increase more learning. So we, I think that parents need to remember this, that success breeds motivation. Yeah. And I've heard you talk about this. Um, I know we've talked about explicit instruction and you've, you've talked about the term, you know, drill and kill. And, you know, I think that that is something we've got to just erase from our thinking because you were so right. I mean, as human beings, you know, what, what is the, the, the strongest motivator we have are the in, incremental steps of success, right? And so when we teach explicitly, we're giving kids that gift of incremental steps of success that propel them forward toward, you know, persevering. You know, I think I mean, we could take any, I think we could take any learning experience we as human beings have had and we can say, okay, what were the incremental steps that propelled you forward to challenge? You know, like I think about you learning cello. I mean, that's certainly a challenging thing to do, but your, your, your steps of success are continuing to propel you forward. And I'm sure that it's true of your own career and mine uh, is that I've had incremental learning and more incremental learning and never stopped. You know, I have a, a webinar tomorrow and I have a whole stack of books here that I wanted to look up certain points uh, for that webinar. And it's just so all of us have that growth, but we have to have intentionality to learn and intentionality to grow. Yeah, we have to set, yeah, set that intention. I agree. And, and because we are teachers, we're educators, um, I think, I hope that 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 lifelong learning is part of our DNA because that's something we're trying to help our students inhabit, you know? Well, I, I would hope it is. And I think that schools can also add to that. You know, I, every time I give a webinar, I send articles. These are the follow-up articles you are to read so that it's easy for people to say, okay, I'll read and discuss that. Uh, yeah. Necessary. So, so on, the, on those lines of growing, do you think, since you began your work, do you think that as a profession, we have uh, developed? And if so, what ways? As a profession, have yes. we developed? That's a hard, hard question mm -hmm. for this reason is that uh, every state I've worked with, every country I've worked with, every district I've worked with, it varies so much uh, from place to place and from teacher to teacher mm -hmm. about how much are they using what we know from science that'll make the most difference. Mm -hmm. 
And sometimes what's happened is we have been influenced away from what makes the most difference. For example, I'll just use your example you gave. Um, when people had would say to me, well, that is uh, just drill and kill, drill and kill. And so then people would say, we're not going to do anymore. We're not going to practice those math facts. We're not going to do those letters to mastery. We're not. So there. So we've had that uh, challenge all the time. We have to look at it and say, now let's re-look at this. And we have people who still believe that new material should be gained by discovery. And yet one of the most, the lowest effect sizes is discovery. If it's new material and you're teaching novices, they will gain it much better if you like teach it. Uh, it's more efficient, more effective. Mm -hmm. So so over the last 54 years, I've constantly, uh, and our field constantly has these that come in that uh, serve as sort of a barrier of giving children the very best. I mean, I just keep saying, let's get back on the path. Let's get back on the path. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And do discovery once they have some knowledge, but not before they have knowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Sometimes, as you well know, we've actually taught the wrong information. For example, one day I walked into a classroom uh, and my beautiful niece was teaching first grade and on the wall was a chart that said, step number one when you're decoding words is look at the pictures. Number two, make a guess based on the first sound. Yeah. Number three, make a guess by the content. So, so are we going forward where we're going forward where there are uh, little rocks in, in the way that need yeah. to be removed? Because that's not what we teach. We teach students if you uh, are going to use the code to figure out an unknown word that you look at the letters left to right and you say the sounds and you blend them together and yeah so i've had this history again and again so we can get off track of what works mm -hmm. yeah i mean i just had a, a conversation with a district that said uh, we want to now move to uh, totally uh, student chosen activities they choose what they want to learn choose the activities learn if they learned it uh, and i said okay so let's let's just look at hattie's work and what effect size that is Ah, 0 0.02, 0 0.02, close to death. Uh, and uh, we would say, you know, 0.4 of an effect size and above, we have that in the zone of behaviors that we would want to yeah. uh, do in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So, but if we keep our eye on learning, that is one very important way to keep on the track because if my students aren't learning yet, are, are many of them are making errors. We're not going to put that burden on them. We're going to put that burden on us to look at the quality of our teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and and you and the reason I ask that question is because I, I think when I think about some of the um, the people you've mentioned and some of the work that's out there that's readily available to us in our profession, you know, I'd like to think that one of the things that we're doing as a profession is we're, we're recognizing that there is an evidence base to our to teaching, you know, that there, and, and I think that I, I know when I came up as a teacher, and this was a long time ago, that um, teaching really rested a lot on, you know, your emotional, you know, uh, connection with the kids or your emotional um, uh, hunches about what would be the right, the next best thing to do with the kids, as opposed to letting you know, an, a, a body of evidence really guide your choices. And I'd like to think that we're, we're recognizing that as a profession. Well, certainly there is more availability of knowledge, yeah. more conferences, more staff development uh, than when I taught 54 years ago. Uh, and uh, so that in terms of a profession having an available body of knowledge, it's there your webinars and many other and looking at uh, uh, books. I've just got a stack of books here to review. All of them are excellent, uh, but not all individuals have that 
as what's happening at their school and their PLCs or what's happening at the district level uh, to make a difference. But we need to. It, it, to me, uh, uh, I've been asked again and again recently, what should we do for equity? Uh, I mean, and so uh, in school districts saying, you know, we need to look at equity. We need to, and I said, well, then let us just look at equitable practice. Uh, using the best teaching procedures possible so that everybody can learn. Yeah. And then removing any practices that aren't equitable. Yeah. For example, the most common one, just to give you an idea, is um, I ask a question and then I ask you to raise your hands and the highest performing, most assertive, most proficient in English, raise your hands. So. What are the other students do? If this is the teacher's habit, pretty soon cognitively they have totally left the place and gone into deep cognitive floating. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, we just need to use the very best instruction so that all students can uh, have the ability to learn at their highest level. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so just continuing to just laser focus on what do we want what do we want kids to learn and what is the pathway of instruction that will get them there this is not to say that teacher student relationship doesn't make a difference no and i don't want to i don't want to imply that at all that the emotion that emotional connection is of course really important yeah the door you smile at them you care about them oh. you notice they have new tennis shoes uh you uh, call on them uh, after you supported them having a correct answer that we could applaud. I mean, so there's much, there's much art to uh, the teacher relationship that goes along with the structure of explicit instruction. Sure, sure. That compat teaching with compassion. Yeah. So what do you think people get wrong about your work? You mentioned some people have come back to you and said, oh, drill and kill. I mean, is that what people get wrong? Or what are, what are some things that are misconceptions maybe about your work? You know, I think Okay, the first misconception is much of the research that was really well done on explicit instruction was done out of a concern for struggling students. So if you look at Tom Lovett's work or Joe Jenkins' work or Doug Carnine's work, uh, they, uh, they all had a desire to be certain that struggling students learned, okay? So then people assume, well, this is good if I have struggling students but not my students. Uh, and that is a total misinterpretation because most of the research has been in general ed, not in special ed. Uh, and, uh, and basically what is fascinating, Laura, is that you just pick any variable in explicit instruction. Let's say that it is review. Okay, review of what we've done in the past, review of the pre-skills that we're doing for today, uh, having a uh, space review over time. Um, now, that would be really useful if you were an eighth grader in algebra. It would be really useful if you were a third grader learning how to do a new paragraph structure. It would be really useful if you're a kindergarten children, child learning letter sound associations. It really wouldn't matter what the domain is. And it really wouldn't matter if you were in general ed or special ed. The thing is, if you're in special ed, it means everything in terms of your growth. If you're a struggling student without it, it's really going to interfere. And so to me, this is to me the biggest challenge I've faced. And maybe it's because, you know, my initial uh, training and teaching was in special ed. Special ed. Okay. My doctorate's in special ed. Uh, but all my work for the last 30 years has been done in general ed predominantly. Mm -hmm. And it's just like you as a learner, I, all the time I have to tell my, uh, my cello teacher, he's a total delight, but I'll stop and say, now, David, what we need to do here is avoid cognitive overload. <laughs> and I'm a novice and you just told me three things in a row and I can't process all of that. And so uh, one of my cello teachers once said, you know, I think I've learned more about teaching than you've learned about cello. <laughs> but that's just, I, uh, um, constantly, it's such a great gift to me uh, to play cello and then to think about, oh, 
I can see why that is so critical. Cognitive overload definitely can occur. Uh, and so he sends me, beautiful after the lesson, he sends me these reports and he says, so with this song, what you want to do is pluck it because your left hand is not strong enough. And this song, what you need to do uh, is work on long bows uh, closer to the fingerboard. Okay. And so he gives me deliberate practice. And that is a research validated practice and explicit instruction is that you make the practice not just practice 30 minutes, Anita, but practice this one and focus on this. Practice this one and focus on it. So what a well, so so what a great two-way lesson you got going here. Number one, for him to for him to have Anita Archer as a student, you know, he can learn more about how to be more explicit as a teacher. But then also for you, like what what he just did for you is he he gave you, you know, kind of dive, he kind of was diagnostic in his in his examination of you and then he was giving you targeted practice so i think you've practiced yeah i think you've taught him well <laughs> yeah yeah if this is all you've thought about for 54 years which is the truth is all you've thought about is how to teach children so that they yeah. can, uh, and uh, have the gifts of knowledge mm -hmm. and skill yeah. And, you know, Anita, and what I love about you, too, is that you haven't just thought about it. Like when you talk about, first of all, you, you do so much professional development for so many people literally around the world. But you also demonstrate and you also get in the classroom and you also practice yourself as a teacher to continue to hone your skills as a teacher. I think that's a don't you think that's a really important thing that you're offering? Well, it's to me, it's really important for me mm -hmm. is with, you know, if I said, you know, 54 years ago, I taught this lesson, there's no credibility in that. And when I can say pre pandemic, two weeks before I taught this lesson and this is what I learned. Mm -hmm. uh, and also because I, my lessons have been videoed and used in so many trainings, um, I get feedback and, and learn from it. And that, but it's, I think that teaching like any other uh, area of skill it takes constant improvement and reflection, you know, and so I was reviewing some videos uh, I had done and I said, oh, Archer, you know, you are consistently not giving enough think time. That's why the errors are occurring. And, you know, it, so it's uh, really being transparent about looking at our craft and what we may do, be doing that is creating learning or not. Yeah. And, you know, I still have students from the University of Oregon and San Diego State who will email me and say, can I send you a little video? I'd love some feedback. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I want teachers to be at that point where they're so yeah. transparent mm -hmm. that they would celebrate um, their craft and want more feedback so they could get better. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And, you know, they're being transparent and they're also, you know, practicing humility. You know, it's like, it's like, I, you know, I haven't achieved mastery in my teaching. I'm continuing to learn as a teacher. I'm continuing to hone my craft. I think that's, I think that's a really one. And when you get, when you get those videos, you must be so gratified, you know? It's fun. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun then uh, being able to talk about instruction. Yeah. Uh, but it is something that we constantly uh, get better at. Right. And one thing that I try to do is, even with virtual lessons, I've been trying to uh, include using all the teaching behaviors that I want teachers to use. Uh, and so, you know, if you came to one of my presentations live, you would be saying things, writing things, doing things. Uh, because that's a model for what you need to do with your own students. Yeah, I, I, Anita, I think that is such a critical part of, of why your work resonates. Because A, you're continuing to, to hone your craft, you're, 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 you're um, eliciting feedback, you're continuing to practice, you're continuing to, um, to learn about your own work as a teacher. Um, and secondly, you're modeling within that professional development experience those attributes of explicit instruction and those attributes of a, of a purposeful and productive lesson. 
And I'm guessing you get that feedback a lot. Thank you for thank you for sh not just telling us, but showing us as well. I get it back, particularly on um, this. I could take back and use. And but it's based on research. I try to be certain that people understand the support for that behavior and the research studies that have been done, uh, and who the authors of them are. And but then model. Watch me do it, yes. so that you would be better able to transfer that into your school and make it very pragmatic. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's our profession has to serve. And so it's certain behaviors, not just uh, theories, but certain behaviors that are very pragmatic. Right, right. So what do you think is, what do you think is getting in our way um, as a profession from continuing to advance and grow? And um, if, if anything is, what do you think it would be getting in our way? Okay, so one thing I think that's getting in the way is that I'm meeting too many new teachers who come up to me and say, Dr. Archer, uh, in this series of webinars, I have learned more than I did in my college about actually how to teach and manage. And so I think that now I honor university professors. I adored being a university professor. I would probably someday when I'm 80, I might return to that career because it was a lovely career. But I think that we have forgotten to ask the question of what is the most powerful skills to mastery that we could give to teachers so that they are safe with children in their very first year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that means that, uh, and some of them have, have no idea about management. They simply, they don't know about a structure of a lesson. Uh, and so I think that is a barrier to our uh, our profession is having people who don't have the foundation that they can put. Now, I will tell you, I have seen some fantastic this year in these since I've been doing hundreds of, <laughs> of teachers yeah. to do this training in different states. Uh, some of them I'm just like amazed. Like I say to myself, oh, I was not that level of teacher in my first year. So some places are doing a very fine job on this, but they have to stop and ask the big question. If teachers are to promote learning, what do they need to know with mastery, with automaticity, uh, so that they can do that? Uh, and if they need to manage behavior, what have they taught? Now we are actually doing a little bit better, I think, in the area of management than we are in teaching because Almost every university has someone there that is on positive behavioral support and intervention. Uh, and so that body of knowledge is being taught. Mm -hmm. uh, and more divergence in terms of how to teach. Quite a, <clears throat> even in your area, your field is reading. Mm -hmm. So they might get um, very good information in terms of what to teach. Uh, so they get phonemic awareness, letter sound associations, uh, they get uh, high frequency words, uh, sight words of instant recognition and fluency, they get the content of it. But that does not necessarily mean that you mm -hmm. are doing the other things that make a difference in terms of learning. Mm -hmm. So the teaching part of it mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. is the one that I see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's some other barriers that are kind of interesting too. And one barrier is that when I go to district so often, I ask the first question, what is the core reading program you're using? What anthology do you use for middle school language arts? What do you use for teaching algebra? Oh, you know, we have professional teachers and those professional teachers can create their own curriculum. Now, I, I have been a teacher and I write curriculum. I'm right now I am revising a program that I wrote first. It's been revised three times, it's the fourth time, and 28 years ago. And we are spending two full years just editing and rewriting a program, Phonics for Reading, with myself, a team of five writers, uh, and an editor with a doctorate. There's no way that if I was a teacher tomorrow and I taught four different subjects that I could duplicate that. 
we must give teachers the best tools of the trade. Yeah. There's still so much to do. You still have to present it in a uh, deliberate, engaging manner. You still mm -hmm. have to monitor their responses. You have to correct their errors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but to say to teachers, you're a professional, you can design your own lessons. Now, here's what's going, what happens, Laura, is that maybe you have five, let's say, fourth grade teachers. Two of them are uh, workaholic experts and, and their kids are still gaining. But the other three uh, have other things that happen outside of school so they don't have the same amount of time to prepare. So then two, uh, the students in two classes out of five classes are really profiting. And so I just, uh, so I, I, I yeah. can tell you how often I've used this analogy. <laughs> so superintendent who thinks they should do their own, you know, let's say a physician uh, who is a surgeon is preparing for tomorrow for surgery. Would you say to them, now you're going to need a scalpel. So just, you know, formulate one and sharpen yeah. it up. Yeah. You would think to give them the very best tools mm -hmm. to carry it out. Mm -hmm. You can't think of one profession where we think they have to create all their tools. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's I, I, I ponder this quite a bit because I totally agree with you. It's it's not only do we have to um, help teachers learn how to teach, but also give them the tools to do that well. Um, and I and I I think about this. Um, I think about this quite a bit. Because I do think that without those resources, if we, if we say to teachers, well, you know, you're a professional, you can figure this out, we trust you, you have autonomy, I actually think that's disempowering for teachers. Because I think that, I think that actually puts a roadblock for teachers asking for help and asking for resources because it's, 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 it's put upon them that, well, no, you should be able to do this. Um, when, in, when in fact, you know, we, we thrive best when we collaborate with one another. We thrive best when we do have the right scalpel <laughs> in our hands. When you look at um, John Hattie's work, which is a very good place to, because of the way he summarizes research studies with his team. So what is one of the highest effect sizes? It is uh, collaborative efficacy. So we are collaborative, but we all believe that we make a difference. We all know that how well I teach uh, leads to how well you learn. Right. Uh, and so then teams can come together with the curriculum. They can talk about when I taught this lesson, I needed to give more review of this. It wasn't broken down enough. Uh, we need to have more cumulative review. How about space practice? Uh, and uh, then also, uh, this sort of definitely goes with explicit instruction, but then you're also more willing to video yourself and have your PLC team look at it. Uh, the principals come in with their administrative team and do walkthroughs, but then the teachers also do walkthroughs. We need to have much more collaboration and much more transparency yeah. so that all children have the highest level of instruction to be provided them. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Amen. And and I think, again, you, you do such a wonderful job of modeling that, um, you know, considering you have um, a lot of experience as a teacher and you have skills as a teacher, but you're continuing to model and be transparent about yourself and about your learning as a teacher. I think that's great. Yeah. So so I, I, I do want to talk about, you know, what was so. OK, so I did watch recently your um, your uh, webinar on explicit teaching in, in the virtual space. I thought that was, I thought that was excellent because I think when, you know, when people started sheltering in place and when schools started go, moving to virtual or hybrid, um, so many teachers were really left with, you know, where can I get some help? And I think that was really wonderful. And so I wondered, in addition to that, what are some things you're working on right now? Well, let me just go back to that experience. Yes. Done. First of all, I've done hundreds of webinars in the pandemic virtually. Okay, so I've had to say, okay, Anita, you know the importance of active participation. How are you going to do it? So, uh, so I've had to change all of my trainings to include more active participation. Uh, but 
here's what I found. Right as the pandemic started, a number of people emailed me and said, one of them was a math teacher from Michigan who was terrific. She said, Anita, I am supposed to do all virtual lessons and I don't know anything about doing this. And I emailed her back and then we uh, had a Zoom together and I said, so when you have a lesson, what do you do first? I greet the kids at the door. Good. What do you do next? Uh, I uh, greet them and then uh, they have a warm up activity to do. Uh -huh. And then what do you do next? I give them feedback on the warm up activity. All right. Then what do you do next? Then, okay. <laughs> so this person had a beautiful pathway. And I said, use the same pathway. You would you know, need to know about really good instruction. And now let's go through it. And we wrote lessons together just for me. It was very useful. Uh, and let's see what we need to do that would be altered because you have to do it a different way. Uh, but it was so interesting. People got so involved in the technology aspects that they forgot the good teaching. And so I had to keep reminding them, good instruction is good instruction. It doesn't yes. matter what the platform is. Yes. It, it's good instruction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, and actually I think that's really reassuring. And the way you, the way you took that teacher through that, you know, what do you know? What, what do you usually do? And then, you know, is this something you can do in the virtual? Yeah. You, you know, these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what else are you working on now? What else am I working on? Besides, besides the cello and virtual teaching, what else are you working on? Uh, I am. So I'm doing many series on explicit instruction for elementary and secondary, mostly because uh, in many states, because people got literacy grants from the federal government that they had to carry them out even during the pandemic. Yeah. So uh, I was very blessed to work with them both on, you know, the science of reading uh, and uh, the science of instruction. And so that is continuous. As I said last week, I had, it was the top, it was too much, but I had 27 webinars just because everybody likes webinars in January or training. So that I'm working on every day. Uh, next, I'm working on Phonics for Reading, which has been a very successful um, program for struggling students in third, fourth, and fifth grade uh, who have not yet mastered the skills uh, that would be taught in kindergarten, first, and second grade. And so it, and what was, What's been interesting about it, written 28 years ago, but what has been interesting is how much we knew 28 years ago. I mean, it had phonemic awareness. It had systematic letter sound associations taught uh, and distributed over time. Uh, it had continuous blending of sounds into words. Uh, it uh, immediately put the words, the sounds, in single syllable words and multisyllabic words so that students would uh, know how to approach a long word. Uh, it taught high frequency irregular words. It paired the encoding with decoding. So they had to spell the words that they were learning. Uh, and it had uh, decodable passages, quite long decodable passages. So if you looked at and it used everything we knew at that time about explicit instruction. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's been interesting is one, to, to have a program because it is for struggling students, it has to, it has to be, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's detail. Every detail counts. So, I mean, we have to go through and we have to look at each word and then count how many words have this sound and that sound. I'll tell you what is sweet about it, Laura, though. We did not have computers 28 years ago when we were first doing it. Interesting. Interesting. It was a ton of work. Manual labor. <clears throat> That's right. We need a multisyllabic word with two closed syllables. Oh, God. <laughs> and then we'll have... So it's easier to make changes. But... Uh, so that, uh, but the things that we have, are adding are also looking at the research today. So if we look at phonemic awareness, many people like David Kilpatrick would say, we need to uh, even have it stronger for struggling mm -hmm. students that are older. 
and use not just blending and segmenting, as which we did, but use adding, subtracting, substituting. Mm-hmm. So that strand had to be altered. Uh, we have better frequency counts on what are like the most common morph- morphographs that we might teach. So we had to alter that sequence. We did predominantly uh, decodable text that was narrative. And these are older kids. Yeah. So we had to go in and uh, edit and then take out. So it's, um, and then we're adding online materials for additional practice, which would not have been available mm-hmm. 20 years ago. So it's just been very exciting to yeah. do. Uh, and, but, but it, you know, 28 years ago, if we all knew all that curriculum, why was it not being taught then? Why is it not being taught now? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not like a body of knowledge that has suddenly appeared in 2021. Yeah, Anita, I, you know, I know that when I speak with teachers and I, we talk about how long this body of evidence has kind of been, you know, this, this repertoire of evidence that has been in our field, people are so surprised by that. And they're like, well, this has been around for 40 plus years. And, you know, it's in, yes, it has. And so, you know, where is the disconnect between this knowledge and practice, right? And I think you've talked so much today about the critical nature of creating that instructional pathway so that we can take the evidence and translate it to in, in a very pragmatic way so that teachers can be trained and supported in actually using this in their teaching, in the, in the, in the science and art of teaching. You know, um, when we use it, when we really use it in classrooms, the children have success. Yes. And that's all what we're about. We are about children feeling successful, celebrating their learning, uh, and that is so rewarding to us that we are more motivated to do it. But I had an experience of a school, uh, the lowest performing school in a fairly large district, uh, and we've been working for four years to get more instruction present uh, and uh, to look at curriculum and just to do all the things we've been talking about. So in the fall, they give assessments to children and they look at the rate of growth over time. There was one school that had 90, 90% growth, 99% growth. That does not mean that they're all at benchmark, but they made 99% growth average, the lowest performing school in the district, which they're not the lowest performing school now. Uh, But... uh, and now the teachers want to spend more time. They want to add, get, ask me that, well, what can we do next? What should we change next? What can yeah. we add? Because it's just like children. Success breeds motivation. Right. And it just, it, it inspires you to want to just keep persevering and working harder. And I, 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 I that's such, and that's such a rewarding thing, I'm sure, for you to be working in schools and see that kind of growth and development. And then to, to see the eagerness with which teachers embrace continuing to learn and grow and change and yeah. That's profession available. Yeah. We get to make the more difference in people's lives than any other profession. Mm. That we get a beautiful people to work with on every day, every school I go to, every state, every country, I see the same thing. Uh, a deep desire to make a difference uh, and abundant kindness in doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Beautifully, beautifully said. I, I oftentimes say, yeah, we get to do this. We get to do this work. We get to do this. We get to do this. Um, yeah, I did want to mention that um, up in the show notes, I will put down, um, you know, your your website, obviously, so people can check out your work. But I'll also include information about the phonics for reading. Is and is that an, and you said that's an intermediate program, three, four, five. It's, uh, that's what it's designed for. Okay. It's the other program is rewards. Mm-hmm. Yes. Better known. That's for rewards is a program to teach predominantly strategies for reading long words, along with the meaning of prefix and suffix mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to improve fluency. And mm-hmm. it's also targeted at, uh, the intermediate rewards, third, fourth, and fifth grade, third, mm-hmm. fourth, and mm-hmm. fifth grade, mm-hmm. and then middle school. Okay. Yeah. I'll put, I'll put those in the show notes for people so they can look those, look into those. I wanted to mention too, what you were describing about your phonics for reading, those principles 
the you know both the the content as well as the instructional protocols it just seems so appropriate for all of our kids you know absolutely it's mm -hmm. uh, it is a program designed for struggling students so that it has significant increased practice and more cumulative review yeah but but basically you're right on it's yeah. more, good instruction truly is good instruction yeah. and so anything we did with struggling students we may not need as much repetition but needs to occur uh at the beginning in fact my my wish because most of my curriculum development has been collaborative and it's been looking at students in uh third fourth fifth grade middle school i would love it that we would never need to use any of my uh, material yeah that we taught it so well i mean you know uh, look at uh, torgerson's research which found that uh, if you had a young student, like in kindergarten, they were behind, that you needed to give them like 10 to 15 minutes extra every day. Mm -hmm. But that when they were like in fifth grade, it's going to take like two hours a day to make up the differential that you'd expect based on their verbal language. Wow. So yes, I want us to do it. Uh, early on, the very best instruction, so that we reduce the number of students that need intervention. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I completely agree. I think about, you know, how do we how do we enact a really solid tier one program for everybody so we cast the widest swath around the most children with the best bang, you know, the practices that do deliver the best bang for the buck. So we have fewer and fewer students in those in those other tiers. And we would always have some, mm -hmm. uh, but right now we have some students that I would say are not really learning disabled, but curriculum and teaching disabled. Yeah. They just have not had the instruction. Mm -hmm. I loved one uh, studies that we did in New York City where students had huge gains. Well, that's because they had never been taught the content. And so, <laughs> So, I mean, our study looked really good because, okay, it wasn't that they were learning disabled, it's just that they had never had the opportunity to get taught it. And yeah. they, so they, they made great, they made great gains. Yeah. Yeah. Gains. Right. Right. We yeah. do the program at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. It's really history and program. Well, another thing I've heard you say is, um, and forgive me if I don't have the words exactly right, but I've heard you say explicit instruction is absolutely imperative for some, but it's good for everybody. That's, I think you said it perfectly. Okay. Also, it goes right along with the new motto, passion, presence, and pathway. Okay. Our new motto. Our new motto. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. It is uh, good for everyone and absolutely necessary for some. So, yeah. So true. So, um, so what are your, Anita, what are your hopes and dreams for teachers? Okay, my hopes and dreams for teachers. First of all, we'd start with a very, very peaceful world so that their children were coming from uh, peaceful, supportive homes uh, and so that they were uh, ripe to learn. Uh, and then they were met by teachers that had excellent student-teacher relationship, open hearts, uh, and we're passionate about being teachers, dedicated to being teachers, put the time into it necessary, collaborative with their other teammates, that they were in a school that had principals that were instructional leaders. Uh, and when they went into that classroom, learning was the target. Learning was what it was all about. And it was shared with them. They celebrated it. The teacher celebrated it. The principal celebrated it. Uh, and we just stuffed them with knowledge so that they can make choices in their life, what they want to do, uh, what they want to think about, what relationships they want to be in, what religions they want to study, that they would have all of the information to do that. Mm -hmm. So it is, um, and you know, my good friend, Doug Carnine, who mm -hmm. was a professor, a well-known professor at the University of Oregon and in the area of reading, uh, he now is retired. Uh, and uh, he writes books on kindness. Uh, and so because we're friends, in fact, I have it here for later a discussion with them, How Love Wins, That's a book that he's, one of the books he's written. Love it. But I think that in addition to 
all of those wishes for our schools where kids could truly thrive, that there would be no practices that uh, would be unequitable, uh, that all students would learn at the highest level, be able to read before they go into third grade. Uh, yes, all of that. Uh, but I would uh, like them to be in a kinder world. Yeah. Yes. That they were taught kindness, uh, that they understood kindness. Uh, and so I would want them to emerge in a world that um, was much more supportive of human yeah. beings. We're meant to be collective. We're meant to be collaborative. Yeah. <laughs> to be kind. Yeah. And that, that kind of, I guess that kind of brings us full circle because when you started talking about uh, Mrs. Finkel and you used the word kindness, you know, that she was, she, she filled your classroom with kindness. Absolutely. So, yeah. You know, it's something we can do yeah. is to teach mm -hmm. well. Teach well. That's what we do that's kind. Yeah. You know, I, um, one of my favorite words recently is flourish. And I think the, I think the vision that you just painted for us as you were describing your hopes and dreams is a, is a, is a vision that allows us all to flourish as human beings, our students, us as teachers. It does not differ from the wonderful teachers I've worked with. Mm -hmm. I think that's their vision too. And principles um, and so sometimes they've just gotten off the path, you need to come back on the path mm -hmm. uh, uh, of something that would make the most difference in work. Absolutely. Wonderful. Aren't we blessed though? Oh, new teachers. yeah. Again, we get, we get to, we you know, we get to jump out of bed every day and do this work, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has just been such a great, great conversation, Nita, and I, but I can't let you go without asking you these rapid fire questions that I've been asking everybody on our podcast. Um, and the first rapid fire question though, you've actually already answered, which is who was your favorite teacher growing up and why? And you've already told us about the beautiful and esteemed Mrs. Finkel. So, so thank you. I, I just want to personally say thank you, Mrs. Finkel for, for um, making it's over for helping Anita Archer be in, be an educator. So thank you, Mrs. Finkel. Um, okay. What is your favorite book? or one of your favorite books, either as a child or as an adult? As a child, my favorite book was The Secret Garden. Oh, it is my favorite book that I oh. was just, I just reread. Yes. Uh, and uh, I love the whole story that went with The Secret Garden, but I also like the message, you know, the, the author of it, early 1900 author of it, her intention was to teach children that if they thought thoughts that were joyful, thoughts that were kind, uh, that their life would be happier. Uh, and that was the message of that book. And I don't think it was such a bad message for someone who's uh, almost 54. Exactly. Oh, that's, and I love that book too. Oh. And as an adult, do you have an, a, a kind of a favorite book as an adult? As an adult. Uh, you know, I sit here with my stack of books. My favorite new book to read, if you have, is uh, Reading Comprehension Blueprint. Good woman. It's good, isn't it? It's really good. Shout out to Nancy Hennessy right here on the podcast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really good. It is so good. Is Did you see how many references? She really honored the fact that anything she's saying had this long background that this study and this work and this work and this work put together in a way that you could use it, uh, it's worth reading, yes. I totally agree. I think she she just, she she honors, she honors this knowledge base, but she also is very pragmatic. Very pragmatic. Mm -hmm. So, Powerful Reading, another book that mm -hmm. if you haven't read it, you should read. Uh, it's about retrieval practice. It's from Cognitive Science. Now, I know that you have read uh, oh, yes. Right. The book that is edited by Kilpatrick, Reading, Development and Difficulties. And then one that is very pragmatic in the area of writing. So if you haven't. Oh, yes. Yes. See, mm -hmm. that's what I read or <laughs> read. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The point is, um, I read you would not find in this house a novel. 
<laughs> uh, I have thousands of books. I have a whole library in my basement I just had done during the pandemic. Uh, new bookcases made in my, and I have a huge library of educational books. I mean, huge, thousands. Uh, and um, so that's what I have read. And this happens to be the little stack that I have to uh, look at today. Yeah. But uh, yes. So what have I read? This is the book that I'm reading because uh, I read uh, often. Ah, okay. On Tyranny. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it is what we should do to avoid uh, a tyranny. Mm -hmm. That sounds, seems appropriate. Yeah. Well, I will put, I'm going to put your recommendations in our show notes too, because I'm sure people will want to, want to maybe follow up on some of those. Cool that you had the blueprint there. That was, isn't that funny? Yeah. I'm, I'm actually, I'm developing a, a webinar on comprehension. So of course I'm going to, you know, to this as a great source. I think it's just terrific. Yeah. You know, also it made a big point, Laura, and that uh, people often ask me, well, what's the one strategy that will make difference for comprehension? And I just have to remind them that students have to be able to read the words, know the meaning of the words, have appropriate background, and focus on the critical content. Yeah. And her book basically looks at that. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm guessing you are, are you probably already answered this one too, but my, another question I always ask people is what do you have on your desk that symbolizes you or is dear to you? Well, is it what you've already showed us, Anita, or you have something else to show us? Oh, what's that? Is that a little bird? That is the bluebird of happiness. Oh. So my mother would get, she had many of these and she gave them to all of her best friends. Hmm. And so I give them to all of my best friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and it reminds me that friendship, we need friendship. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. That is it. One other thing on my desk is mostly uh, a desk filled with things to do. <laughs> yeah, from one of my friends, because my uh, favorite thing that I've had to watch out my window during this pandemic is Woody the... Uh, woodpecker. Oh. And she got me this uh, symbol of Woody. Love that. So I had time to watch. I watched uh, Woody make a nest. I watched Woody peck. I watched Woody mate. Uh, I watched Woody uh, and uh, partner feed little ones right out my window. I love it. You watched the whole circle, the whole cycle of Woody's life right there, open folding in front of you. So much so that Woody, and this may be a, a misinterpretation of Woody, but when I'd sit down, I, I'm certain he turned his head as if to say, good morning, Dr. Archer. But I'm not, I'm not so certain about that, about Woody. But anyway, so that was given me as a reminder of the year of Woody. I love it. I'm not sure yet if I'm going to... Uh, continue work from this or be mm -hmm. back traveling the world. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I do miss, um, you know, right now I have contracts in Hawaii and I can't even go to Hawaii. Right. I work in Australia. I can't go there. So. Yeah. Well, and I know, and I know how important uh, music is to you and I'm sure, uh, you know, like me, I, I, you know, I've, I've really longed for, you know, return to the symphony and return to live music. And I know we're both looking, all of us are looking forward to that too. To live music. But aren't we blessed? We can just, I mean, I listen to cello music all day long. Mm -hmm. I turn it off uh, mm -hmm. for the podcast, but mm -hmm. yeah, music makes a huge difference in our souls. Yes, it does. Well, you have, you and you've brought up a lot of gifts that have, have really blessed us, uh, especially in this time of, staying home. So, so thank you for that. Thank you for those reminders today. I really appreciate that. You know, it's sort of what kind of perception we want to take on at any moment, uh, you know, and so there were some deep challenges and there continues to be deep challenges, uh, but there's also some gifts in this. And so many people, I started gardening. I mean, I've never gardened Oh, you've never been around long enough to see anything come from your gardens, probably. So I planted way too much kale. I had <laughs> to kneel for months, but to, yeah, it was, so that was a gift. Cello, you can't travel with a cello with ease. And I have a beautiful old, old cello. And so, yes, that was a gift. Hmm. You know, I remember one, go ahead. Sorry. 
I was going to say, I remember one of the first times I met you and you had your little travel cello. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. for a long time, I traveled with one, but then two suitcases and a cello was a little much. So <laughs> that's why I needed to use yeah. this time to practice. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, um, Anita, for this time. And I know that our listeners are just going to just love this, love this conversation so much. I just, um, and you know, whether you're on the road or whether you're in your beautiful home, I just, I, I thank you for all the contributions that you've made and that you continue to make to our profession, to teachers and students everywhere. Um, and, you know, just thank you. Thank you for the person you are and just the presence that you bring to the world. It's, it's just much, it's much appreciated. I feel such a gift to be a teacher. Amen. So I think we'll, we'll end it at that. And, and thanks again. I really appreciate you, Anita. Thank you. And I appreciate you, Laura. We've had some many good times together. Yes, we have. And, and have tea again. And here's to many more. Many more. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. Bye-bye. You know, I found that conversation with Anita deep and rich and and really reassuring, and I hope you did as well. You know, we at the Reading League are proud to be able to bring these conversations to you. If you haven't done so already, please check us out at the Reading League, www.thereadingleague.org. We, we hope that you become a member and join our community. And if you enjoy this podcast, please spread the word. We would love it if you would go to iTunes and rate us. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.